Hi, welcome back. So on this uh, second video, I will uh, briefly walk you through the prerequisites of this course. So basically what I expect you to know already before coming to this course. So um, I understand that the um, backgrounds of the, of the students of this course vary a lot. Uh, uh, so uh, some, some level of uh, introductory statistics uh, I would expect to, to have already before the course, wherever you have uh, have uh, obtained this kind of level of knowledge. It might come already from the secondary school or high school or from previous courses in, in uh, our university or some other university. Uh, for uh, students in the bachelor program of the, of the our school, uh, we have uh, some courses in Finnish language uh, uh, called Taulukolaskenta ja Analytiikka and Tilastotieteen uh, Perusteet. And if possible, it would be also also useful to have this Tilastotieteen uh, Jatkokurssi R, but that's not mandatory. In some sense, these are recommended prerequisites. Uh, uh, if you if you haven't done those courses, but you feel that you you uh, you have the necessary level of knowledge to follow those follow this course, then feel free to to take this course also. So none of this is really uh, strictly mandatory. The main thing is to have some some level of uh, statistics because uh, we cannot uh, explain all all these kind of basic uh, uh, basic uh, ideas of statistics uh, at this uh, this course. So I will walk you through that some what is essential knowledge uh, and this is also serves as a refresher if it's already some while ago that you took the introductory statistics courses. So here's the checklist. I will I will briefly discuss uh, descriptive statistics, random variables, probability distributions, uh, and then uh, expected value and variance. Uh, Actually, sampling and estimation we come to in uh, in uh, in this course quite thoroughly, so so we will not uh, need to need to do that. But these are kind of topics that uh, would be covered in uh, introductory statistics courses. So so what I mean to mean by the introductory statistics, it's uh, topics like this that you should already have some some uh, some familiarity with. That if it comes as the first time to you in this course, it might be difficult to follow. Of course, if you are willing to put some additional effort and uh, and work hard to also learn on your own, then then it's also fine. So, what about descriptive statistics? Uh, this is not something that I will ask in the exam, but I basically assume that you have some idea of uh, of the of the uh, distributions of random variables, how to present uh, frequency distributions. Uh, how to measure location and variance by, by statistics such as mean and median and mode. What's the meaning of variance and standard deviation, for example. So this kind of basic uh, uh, statistics that are used to describe a sample or, 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 or a distribution. So the concept of random variable I find that it's quite tricky for many, many students that, that, that uh, this is also something that we will deepen uh, on uh, during this course. So, um, but, uh, but the concept of random variable is something that is often, often very hard, even if you're like very um, mathematically skilled and, and mathematics is easy. Sometimes it's even, even more difficult for, for, for thoroughly mathematically thinking students to understand the notion of random variable, because this is something that uh, that uh, uh, is is sort of difficult to, to there's this kind of element of uh, of randomness. So we will also 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 come to that quite a lot. But uh, some basic exposure to the random variables and probability distributions uh, would be very helpful at this stage. So um, about estimation. It would be good if you have the have understanding of uh, what's the difference between basic concepts such as estimator versus estimate. I will I will discuss that uh, that a uh, little bit later. But uh, but uh, but uh, it's it's useful to know. And also then the properties of estimator, uh, unbiasedness, uh, variance, consistency. I will also walk you through those kind of properties during this course. But if you have been exposed uh, to those already before then it will be easier to, to, to put it in the context of, of this, uh, this course. 
So regarding notation, uh, I will I will employ in my my lectures and my slides the the sigma notation quite uh, quite heavily. When we need to take a sum over random variables, uh, then uh, then this sigma notation is just convenient, and as this example on this current slide uh, illustrates. So if we have, for example, uh, n random variables uh, denoted by x and and uh, subscript uh, i indicates the observation so we have sum of x1 plus x2 plus uh, so and so and so until xn then we can we can more briefly indicate it with this uh, sigma so the sigma is this capital capital greek letter that just indicates uh, we, we can then use this uh, subscript to indicate this uh, this uh, items that we sum over Sometimes this uh, it's not explicitly stated. Okay, which uh, which uh, which I if it if it's obvious from the from the context already and how many how many observations there are in this uh, this case. So there are some some basic rules also that we will utilize also. So I do not have a lot of mathematical proofs in the in the course, but some some I I will have, uh, and there there I will apply also these three basic. Uh, rules for the sigma operator so first one is that uh, that if we have two random variables x and y and then we then we sum over the sum of these uh, random variables then we can separate the sigma operator to two parts they can have this uh, sum of xi plus sum of yi in some sense this rule comes from the fact that uh, we can always uh, uh, reorganize this sum in different uh, different order so the order in which we sum these different elements doesn't doesn't matter. So we can always take, for example, sum of x1 and y1, and then add x2 and y2, and so on. But we can also first sum all the elements of x variable and all the elements of y variable, and we get the same result. The second rule is that uh, that uh, if we have some sum of uh, of uh, variable x. And all of the elements in this uh, this uh, sum are, are multiplied by some constant a, so then we can move this uh, uh, constant a outside the sigma operator, as as this rule a indicates. And the third rule is that if we sum constant a n times, then we can actually eliminate the sigma operator, and we just uh, we just multiply by by n this constant a. So if it is a plus a plus a plus a n times, so obviously it's n times a. So when you see these the three rules presented this way, I believe that they look quite obvious and natural, but it's it becomes more 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 difficult when when you have then some uh, some uh, more lengthy proof and uh, and when I will utilize these properties as a part of the proof, then then it might be not so obvious anymore. So that's why it's important to. To, to pay some attention to this uh, to the sigma rules at this point so that we will we will find them more more easy to understand later on there's also other rules that we will we will apply so 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 that's why that's why it's good to good to be aware of these uh, these properties of the sigma operator no in uh, econometrics, we are very often interested in uh, in uh, association between two or more random variables, and uh, in statistics, an important measure of association is uh, covariance. And here's the how how uh, population covariance is defined. So I will discuss with you the difference between population covariance and sample covariance a little bit later. But this is for the for the population covariance. And you might remember this uh, more widely used uh, term correlation coefficient. So you can think of the correlation coefficient just as a as a as a normalized uh, uh, version or, or or rescaled version of the of the covariance. And importantly, if we have uh, two statistically independent random variables x and y, then this covariance uh, of x and y is equal to zero. So so uh, and also the dependence can be positive or negative. So I believe that you have some idea of correlation and, and covariance already. Also, the covariance statistic has certain certain rules that we will later later utilize. So I will briefly walk you through these three three rules now. So in the first rule, we consider three different random variables. We have x and v and w. All of them are random variables. 
And the first rule says that if uh, if this um, if we are interested in covariance between uh, x and the sum of v and w, then we can take this covariance separately. We can take covariance of x and v, and then we can add covariance of x and w. And the, this sum sum of covariances is the same as the covariance of the x and sum of v v plus w. So that means that covariance in this sense is uh, separatable. Second rule is that, um, okay, we have now two random variables x and z. And suppose that this random variable z is multiplied by some constant b. So then we can harmlessly move this, uh, this constant b outside this covariance operator and, and uh, take uh, b times covariance of x and z. This is also applies to any, any, any two random variables. And finally, if we want to have a covariance of random variable x and some constant b, then by definition, actually, then covariance is uh, equal to zero. Because simply uh, b is a constant, it doesn't vary at all. So, so then covariance will be, will be equal to zero. So when we, when we encounter this kind of uh, covariances with, with the constant and some random variable, they will, they will go to zero automatically. Again, these rules uh, probably look very, very natural and uh, uh, sort of uh, obvious at this, uh, this stage. But when we will utilize them in combination with other rules to prove some results, then they might not anymore appear so, so obvious. So, so uh, please make sure that you, you, you uh, understand these covariance rules very thoroughly. So, as the final concept that I want to discuss in this lecture is, is then the, the variance. And, and this is measure of a dispersion of a random variable around its mean. And again, I here talk about the population variance. I will then introduce the difference between sample variance and population variance in, a, in the later les lessons. So variance is about the dispersion around the mean. And then, then there's a related concept of standard deviation which is just the uh, square root of the, of the variance. The standard deviation is often useful because uh, it's uh, measured in the same units as the original variable, whereas this, uh, this, this um, variance is uh, uh, in squared. So for example, if uh, suppose that this random variable X is, uh, is measured in, in euros, so it's a monetary measure, measure let's say turnover of the, of the company, so then the variance unit of measurement for the variance would be euros to power two. But if we take the square root, then, then, then square root is expressed also in, in euros. So that's a practical reason why the square root is often a convenient measure of dispersion compared to the, to the variance. So from the theoretical point of view, there is not necessarily a big difference, but, uh, but we will also, also utilize the, so, so square root is, is very convenient for descriptive purposes, but in, uh, in theory, actually variance we will, we will utilize quite heavily, as we will see later. In, in some sense, they both have the same, same information. If you know the variance, you can always calculate the square root. If you know the square root, you can always, um, always sorry, if you know the standard deviation, you can always, always calculate the variance. And uh, finally, I hope that uh, this slide doesn't confuse to, you too badly. There are also uh, a few variance rules that we will make use of. And now there are slightly some differences to the covariance rules that we discussed earlier. So variance can be sometimes a little bit more, more cryptic concept. So the first rule, suppose that we, we want to have a variance of a sum of two random variables, V and W. So it is possible to separate this, uh, take, take variance of V and, and variance of W. But if you are interested in the variance of the V plus W, we also have to take into account the covariance between V and W because the, the covariance can either increase or decrease the, the variance of the sum of the two random variables. So the rule number one states that the variance of uh, V plus W is the sum of variances of V and W plus two times the covariance of V and W. 
So there's only exception that if, if these two random variables V and W are independent, so if the covariance is zero, then the sum of uh, the variances is the same as the variance of the sum. But when, whenever there is some correlation between V and W, then we also need to take this covariance term into account. In fact, this is, uh, this is also importantly, if, if you, for example, think about the portfolio diversification in, uh, uh, in, the, in the investment decisions. Uh, so this is, uh, this is why, for example, portfolio diversification can decrease the, the variance of the, on, and the risk of your portfolio um, because of this kind of uh, covariance term. So in some sense, that's really fundamental in, in, uh, in business and economics. The second rule is also something I'm sure that you have encountered it, uh, it before, but, uh, but, uh, but it's good to remind it. So if we, if we have random variable Z and we multiply it with some constant B, then the variance of, of B times Z is not actually B times variance of Z, but rather it's B to power two times variance of Z. And this is also, also very fundamental consequences in the, in the, uh, statistics and in estimation because of this property of variance for example increasing the sample size increases the estimator uh, more than more than just proportionately the third rule is is uh, that the variance of some constant b is always zero that's that's uh, kind of intuitive because if you have a, just a constant, then, then constant doesn't really change anything. So dispersion must be zero. And finally, if we, the rule number four is that if we have some random variable V and we add some constant, in some sense, this would be kind of shifting the distribution of the random variable V to the left or to the right by constant B. It doesn't change the variance at all. So variance of V plus constant B is the same as variance of V. So again, these four rules are probably quite obvious and, uh, and straightforward when you see it presented like this. But then again, when please make sure that you understand these rules so that we can later utilize them when we, when we are proving some properties of the, of the estimators. In particular, this rule number one and rule number two are actually quite, uh, quite fundamental results that uh, often cause them some, some uh, curious questions later on as we proceed. So that concludes my, my discussion of the prerequisites. I will in the next video then uh, discuss with you the empirical example related to the housing market. Thanks and bye.